great. Thanks so much. Thank you Thanks, and Claire. welcome. Hey, John. Sorry. I, I just said, hey, Claire, hey, John. <laughs> hey. Hey. Hey, right Thank back. you and welcome to the March 1st Dr. Cog board work session. I'm Wynne Shaw, Vice Chair of Dr. Cog and the Chair of today's board work session. It is 4 o'clock p.m. and our meeting is now in order. The first business in order is to open the floor to public comment. And uh, I don't believe I see anyone's hands raised for public comment. Melinda, do you see anyone? At this point in time, I do not, Madam Chair. All right, thank you very much. Uh, with no one here for public comment, we'll close the period for public comment. Our next business in order is the summary of the February 1st board work session. Are there any questions or changes? Hearing none, uh, the summary will be accepted as distributed. The next business in order is population cohort and household type forecast, a brief summary of the next 30 years, presented by Zach Feldman, Manager, Regional Planning and Development. Zach, the floor is yours. Hi, I'm Zach Feldman. I'm an economist with Dr. Cog in the planning division and happy to um, run through a bit of a summary of some of the publicly available forecast data for our region. Um, it wasn't exactly planned, but I think this is going to just work out perfectly to flow right into Jayla's presentation next. These, these two are both just um, really tied together. Um, just a quick outline, we'll, we'll discuss where these data sources are come from, primarily to, primarily to emphasize that these aren't Dr. Cog produced data sources that um, we rely on others. Um, and then we'll look at two different types of forecasted changes, both population growth and household growth. They generally are moving in the same way, but the types of variation we see going forward are slightly different. And then we'll briefly discuss some of the implications for the Denver region. Our primary source for a lot of this is the State Demography Office. Um, we have a, a great relationship with them and they're, they're really, really great partners. Um, they produce a population forecast by county out through 2050. And they also stratify this by sex and single year of age. So we have a lot of detail um, on population forecasts by county. The second piece that we're going to look at today is, is their um, household forecasts by county through 2050. They stratify this by age of um, head of household and also by household type. So more than one adult versus one adult and with and without children. Some of uh, related information is available online on the Dr. Cobb web website. There are a few um, data briefs that have touched on this, um, though the data is a little bit Older and then the demography office also has a um, handout on these population and economic trends um, that are that is really telling a very similar story. This is a really simple look at the population growth from 1990 to 2050. The takeaway here is that it's it's not just a free fall that we're going to have slowing growth in the region and we're going to see the ways that we're going to have that but in general doctor the the denver region the dr cog counties are going to continue to grow um it's not like we're going to be like certain regions of the country like chicago or something where where it's basically flat we're going to continue to see growth The other piece is that this slowdown isn't really a Denver story either. So if we look at the Dr. Cog region by decade, and we look at Colorado by decade, and we look at the nation by decade, all of those are showing a slowing down in population growth. And the Denver region and Colorado are going to continue to be 
growing faster than um, the nation as a whole. So even as we talk about this slowing population growth, we're still relatively considered to be a um, growing region. If we break it out into roughly the last 30 years and the next 30 years, it, it, it makes this comparison a little more uh, clear that the last 30 years we saw a 76% 70 increase in population. And over the next 30 years, it's gonna be a 25% increase. It's still growing. It's a pretty big drop off in the speed of that growth. And again, we can see that even as we slow down, we're gonna be growing faster than um, the nation as a whole. Here is the age cohort piece. So while we're gonna to continue to grow, zero to 17, so children is gonna be completely falling off. So we're basically gonna see no growth in um, under 18 age over the next 30 years where we saw 50% increase previously, um, kind of considered that working age, 18 to 65, is gonna go from 75% growth in the last 30 years to 17% of the next. It's that 65 plus, which is gonna to continue to see fast growth. So we are gonna have a doubling over the next 30 years. Here's another way of looking at it with roughly the same data. So here we have 65 plus, this working age population and um, children, we can see that the children very flat um, and that the older adults are going to continue to have massive growth um, compared to where they were in, in, say, 1990. This has huge implications for housing need in the region that most of the additional households, as we're going to see in coming slides, is really coming from households without children and coming from older adult households. Here's another kind of just broad look to kind of again point out that we're going to see a real slowdown in growth, but it's not going to be flat and it's not going to be a drop in number of households in the region. This is the way that we can kind of break it out from the demography office. So on the left, we have the household type. So more than one adult with children, more than one adult with no children, one adult with children, one adult with no children. And if we go all the way over to the right, we can see that over the next 30 years or 2020 to 2050, the huge majority of growth in the households is coming from households with no children. Um, more than one adult with no children or one adult with no children. And this is already playing out in, around the region and around the country as, as we see declining um, enrollment for schools and universities. If we look across, across the top, we can see age cohorts. And we see that the 18 to 24 is actually going to decline over the next 30 years, forecasted by the demography office. And the most of the growth is going to be in this 45 to 65, 64 or 65 plus. So we're seeing kind of two different axes. The growth is coming in older adult households and or headed by older adults, and the growth is coming in households with no children. Here's another way of looking at this. So this is, um, if we look at this pink line, this is the um, household growth without children, and the blue is with. And we can see that the, the growth in households in this region is really coming uh, from households with, without children. And here's one more way to look at it. So this is of the house, house, households without children, where are we seeing that growth in terms of uh, age groups? So we're seeing relatively modest growth for um, those under 65. The bulk of this household growth is coming from uh, older adult headed households.
So a couple of takeaways, the Denver region is not in free fall. It's not gonna see a decrease in population, but it's gonna be significantly slower than we've seen in the previous um, three decades. Denver and Colorado are gonna to continue to see faster population growth than the national average. Uh, but the Denver region is really gonna see basically no growth in children and, and potentially even a decrease in the um, number of households headed by um, young adults. We're gonna to continue to see fast growth among older adults, seven times faster. So we're gonna see 99%, so a doubling of the 65%, 65 and older population with only a 13% growth rate for under 65. Um, again, most of this forecast of growth is gonna be among older adult households and households without children. And the transportation demands, the housing demands are gonna be um, very different because of this in terms of the type of households and the, the age of, the, of these households. Um, there's still a lot of unknowns. We really don't know what things are gonna look like in 10, 20, 30 years in terms of are old, older adults going to um, continue to live in, in larger houses are, as they are now? Are they going to are they going to work longer? There are, we, there's a lot of unknowns, but um, we can expect some pretty some pretty big changes going forward. One kind of caveat to all of this is the way the demography office does these forecasts. Um, they're really based at the very beginning on a macro forecast. So as that macro forecast changes, so if, if, if the outlook for the Denver region changes drastically and it is no longer competitive because of um, housing or businesses that are in this area, this forecast could change. So we could see a, a, a decrease in, in, in later years if that macro outlook um, changes. Are there, any questions? Director Peck, I see your hand is up. Questions for Zach? Thank you, um, Chair. Yeah, I do, Zach. And this may have been something that I missed, but you had said that uh, the growth in the seniors was 166%. Uh, percent. Did I see that correctly? Um, and that we were growing, um, that our state was growing. My question is that what I don't understand is who is moving here? If uh, Is it the older people as we grow? Is it the people who are here that are aging? Uh, where is this growth coming from and why in Colorado? Yeah, so a lot of it is going to be households and adults that are already here Aging into this co aging into this older adult cohort. There, there's also some out of state movement um, to the Colorado region to retire. There also tends to be some movement from the mountain communities down into Denver as people age. But a lot of it is is that cohort effect that um, those that live here are going to be aging into that uh, age group. And as we look at uh, our lack of housing, knowing what the forecast is, what type of housing should we be prepared to build? Um, I saw that you said we're gonna have more services that are needed for the elderly um, and that they may be looking to downsize. So as we plan our municipalities, what, what would be the forecast on, on how we should go grow? Um, so that's I, always interesting. Yeah, I, and I can speak that a little bit, but I'm an economist and not a oh. nerd, so I'm probably going to leave that for Jayla, and I think that that will be something that she can touch on in just a few minutes. Okay, it's, thank it's, you. It's a, it's a super important question, and it's very um, integral to what what this region is going to look like for older adults going forward. Okay, thanks. Thank you, and I see Director, Executive Director Rex has his hand up, so he may have some thoughts. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. And I'll be I'll be quick. And I, I just wanted to address Director Peck's question. Um, you know, that's part of the conversations we've been having as a board, right, with, with regards to, you know, where we're headed in the future. We know some of the demographic information that we have is trending in a direction. And the question is, is whether our current inventory of housing or what we're considering building in the future will accommodate that type of demographic. And I I don't, I don't know the answer. I think we're very interested in doing a, a housing assessment. And, and uh, you know, this is something we've had conversations about, about doing a regional housing strategy once we have that assessment. And then, you know, really, really diving in deep with the local communities to, to see what the opportunities are. But uh, I guess the answer is you have to be determined, right? But it's all about aging in place, right? I mean, I think this is what Zach presents really shows that, you know, this, that the net migration is of, of older adults um, is creating an environment that um, we know that, you know, we're going to have different needs, right? And, and housing and transportation and how they link together and all that kind of good stuff. There's a, you know, from planner, planning wonk, I mean, I love this stuff, right? I think it's an exciting conversation, but it's, but in, in the real world, um, this is some serious conversations that you all need to have as elected or locally elected officials. And make sure that our communities are provided for going into the future. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, absolutely. Uh, Director Harrison. Thank you. Um, so number one question would be, are there other states that are similar or already there in terms of what this demographic may look like in the next 20 or 30 years that we can take whatever best practices or examine how they're dealing with a lot of those issues that we may be dealing with in the next 10, 15 years. Is there a way to find that data to, to take a look at that kind of future going, looking out into the future? I don't know. I think that's an excellent way of looking at it. I think we'll have to look into that and see, because there are, there are two pieces that are going together that we're, we're having an aging population and we're still having a growing population. And there are, right. some, there are some regions and states that don't have that. They've got the aging population, but they've got a flat overall. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's an interesting way to look at it. We'll have to look into and see if there are some good candidates uh, for comparison. Not only yeah, they, it might look like we do now, but looked this way 10 years ago. At, right. If I can jump in here, um, there are uh, some states that we can learn from. Uh, I think there, there are states that we can learn from uh, who had a rapidly aging population, right? Um, and that's Florida and Arizona. And, and some of the things that when I talk with developers or people, uh, planners there, they say, oh, we wish we would have thought about this, right? So Florida <laughs> built all these golf course communities, and they never thought that those people were going to turn 85 or 90. And now people in those golf course communities are changing, and mm -hmm. the clubhouses are becoming service centers, and they're still yeah. using the golf course or the golf carts to drive around, but they're not golfing. So I, I think it, there are some lessons we can learn from those populations that have a large, a large um, aging population right now. Right, and I think, um, and, and, and that's, I think would be helpful to kind of take a look at or whatever best practices or, or take what is similar to what we have here. Obviously the demographics, educational background, income levels are gonna be drastically different from state to state and city yeah. to city, as we all know. Um, so that may be one way to have a window into the future. But I guess the next thing we all, as we all know, we've examined that the impacts of having this sort of these sort of demographic shifts is that from a tax perspective and revenue perspective, you're not going to have as many people to be able to support the older populations like right. us in 20 years yeah. or me in 10, I guess, um, that uh, that that is going to be there in terms of that. So what does that mean that there's going to be a, a, a more uh, regressive tax in the sense of for those people who are making more money, we're going to ta have to tax them more to take care of people who are older? because we, to account for the people that we don't have than those areas of populations that aren't growing. And so this is not only affects that, but also on the educational level with schools, obviously here in Erie, we're busting at the seams right now. 
Now, based on what we see here, would Erie still, would that look a lot slower 20 years from now uh, if we're totally built out? We still have our average age here, I think is around 37 years old, demographic wise for the town of Erie of 32,000 people. And so there may still be some room for us locally, but I understand that other parts of the communities and, and other parts of the state are going to look a lot different than that. So I think, you know, education in terms of the schools, school size, population levels, do you build more schools? And then all of a sudden, if your population drops off with your kids, you have these big, huge, hulking schools with, with, you know, not that much of a student population. So I guess that's one of the things from a housing perspective is to look at is we're going to have to figure out ways as we all go back to our, at least go back to our days, if, if those of you are my age of 53 and a little over, to say, we remember erector sets and say, how do we construct buildings that are multi-use and can serve different purposes for that shift that will eventually happen and also our roads and et cetera. So I think there's a lot of things here and here that we're gonna have to take a look at uh, from that perspective. Absolutely, thank you. And Director Levy? Well, thanks. Uh, I think uh, Director Harrison really hit on a lot of the things I wanted to talk about, but I'll just, uh, I'll say them um, um, maybe in a slightly different way. But I, I think, um, well, one of the questions I had about this data is whether <clears throat> it can be broken down a little bit more by area within the Dr. Todd boundary, because um, I think, you know, we're already seeing, uh, you know, within Boulder County, and Director Harrison alluded to this, um, the Boulder, the, the schools in Boulder, um, there's declining enrollment, and, but yet in Erie, they're, you know, they're busting at the seams. It'd be really great to get this broken down a little bit more by area. Um, but when I look at this, I, the two biggest things that come to mind for me, one, the thing that Mayor Peck already raised, which is, um, you know, we've been building housing in, in the Denver metro area for families with kids. And we have a tax structure that um, I don't know if it, I, I mean, I don't think it helps incentivize people moving right sizing in their house. So we've got a, we've got people, myself included, I'm a poster child for this. I'm consuming so much square footage. My husband and I were empty nesters. So, you know, we've got a lot of policies like that that we have to really think about how to um, how do we how do we incentivize um, uh, folks not to consume too much housing space? Um, how do we get the right kind of housing bill? And then how do we look at our tax structure uh, as we get older and we buy less stuff and we consume more services? Um, what's going to, are we going to have the right tax structure in place to still fund the services that we need? Um, so those are just some thoughts that have come up for me on this. Thank you. You know, it's interesting. You do bring up a good point that um, those of us who are single, who have experienced appreciation of more than $250,000 in their home are not ever going anywhere. And we are not turning our large homes over to the families that need them. So uh, it's a real interesting tax conundrum, uh, federally speaking. So, and, and how do you downsize if you're paying a large capital gain tax on uh, your appreciated home? A uh, lot of things to think about there. Um, Director Fahey. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I just want to bring up the other issue that needs to be considered in housing and transportation is the whole uh, DEIA problem. Mm -hmm. um, we've got people who are either handicapped or, or like the elderly, can't get around quite the way they used to be able to. Um, so that's going to affect all the transportation issues. Then how do they afford, like you said, to downsize from a big house to a little house or move up from a rental apartment into a, a, an affordable home? 
Um, so there's a lot of issues going on that and then they all kind of come together on this one topic of housing. So it's housing and transportation are the big problems I see right now. So that's all. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Director Nirmala. Uh, thank you. Um, the thing that I am thinking about is, you know, do we have the housing stock to accommodate the, these older adults right now? One, a lot of people aren't moving all right out of their houses because there's nowhere to move to, right. even if they could afford something, you know, like my mother, for example, lives in, um, she, or she would like to live in just, you know, a one or two bedroom place. She can't handle a house. She, she can't drive. She's legally blind. So like, and, and that's just an example of where people are, you know, especially with um, the accessibility and the transportation issues. Um, we don't have condos being built. We don't have ownership opportunities for people. The other thing I'm worried about too is with respect to um, the affordable housing stock that we have. Right now, where I'm seeing a, a deficit is the, we have a market rate solution for that sort of, continuum of continuum of care where people can age in place within a community first as an independent level and then later on, you know, with more um, with more support, but do we really have the infrastructure for that for affordable senior facilities? And so I, it's just like this whole. Um, and in Westminster, we also have a lot of people that are that are actually stranded in their homes in a way where they do rely on family or others to get mm -hmm. them to their appointments and. We have areas where they're not well serviced by, you know, they can't access or walk to grocery stores. So like where, are, just identifying environments for people who don't drive. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, those are, that's all my random thoughts for all <laughs> and worries. Thank you for sharing them. Director Dyack. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna sort of take off the, uh, uh, the theme that we're talking about here. It seems like we do a lot of planning and a lot of uh, analysis on what would be ideal. Um, my, my thought or my question is, is anybody engaging those people who are aging in place who have uh, non-efficient housing and asking them what it would take for them to move to what we view as a more efficient means? Uh, my mom, She's going to age in place. She's going to stay in her house until uh, she passes away, hopefully knock on wood. Um, there's a certain amount of behavior uh, issues you have to overcome. I mean, the theory is great, but um, if, if we want to um, move the needle, we need to engage those people, ask the questions, and probably, uh, as to Director Levy's uh, comments, figure out a way to engage the higher powers, the federal governments, to incentivize um, those people who um, need to sell their homes and go into a, a more efficient um, means of living in order to, um, I guess, carry out their golden years. So is there anybody who's, who's going through that process to engage those people and ask those questions? It's a good question. Um, I I was going to ask uh, Director Mahold if uh, he had a question. He had his hand raised earlier, but before I uh, yeah. recognize Trustee Harrison. Uh, the, the question was primarily around data source. Uh, this is coming from the state demographer. I, I would assume it's based on census data. It comes up out every 10 years. What do they do in the middle, Zach? Um, how do they keep this up to date? Yeah, so they, they sort of peg it every 10 years on the census. And then in the interim years, they get um, birth and death records. They get mm -hmm. um, housing data. Um, they basically do kind of a cohort analysis where they sort of age these households um, to see where they think um, the population and household numbers are gonna be going in the future. There's mm -hmm. also the macro component in terms of they, um, 
they do a forecast of how many jobs they think will be needed depending on the economy of their forecast for Moody's. Mm -hmm. And if there aren't enough people, then they that's some of what determines that net migration into the region and their modeling. So they've baked in the outlook for the economy overall. Okay. And did they, uh, did they assign confidence intervals? For instance, uh, th th I think the most stunning thing to me is the no children that's yeah. just stunning yeah. um and I'm, I'm i'm from what i'm hearing from other demographers it's pretty consistent across the nation it's consistent with where we're at in the life of the nation but um it, it, do i mean is there a pretty high confidence interval in in the data and should we be planning on it uh with a high degree of confidence there's a pretty good um confidence in it especially over the next decade and also the key is there will be households with young children it's just that there won't be growth so however many households there are with young children those will age out and new new households will come in there just won't be more of them than there are presently whereas in the past every year there were more households with kids so if two households aged out and no longer had kids three would take its place and now for everyone sure. who kind of ages out one will take its place okay excellent thank you and then to follow up um, with breaking out this data into smaller levels, um, I'm going to drop in the chat actually a resource we have on Dr. Cog website, Community Profiles, that breaks mm -hmm. it out by jurisdiction. This more relies on ACS data since we can get that from the Census Bureau for uh, places. We haven't incorporated these forecasts, but hearing this feedback, that's something we can bring into it in the future, not the jurisdiction level, because that's kind of a moving target and difficult to deal with in terms of annexations, but uh, we could bring in the county level forecasts, um, since it sounds like that would be helpful to folks. Sounds yeah, good. It looks like, Zach, uh, it, when I uh, click on that thing and, and just take a, a quick look, it looks like the growth in the state is almost exactly the same shape as the growth in, in the metro area. It, it's pretty close. Uh, as we get out to the tail end, I think currently the, the, the state's forecasted to grow a tiny bit more, uh, but we're talking a couple percent here or there. In general, it's gonna be pretty close. Okay. Great, thank you. Director Harrison. Thank you. Sorry uh, to come in again, but uh, Director Nirmala, um, along her thread, is for those who are aging out who live in this area or who are in their 60s, 70s, and they're in a larger home. The fact of the matter is, whether depending on their equity and obviously where they live, not everybody lives in Boulder, not everybody lives in Erie, where you saw these drastic increases. Um, and housing prices for them to be able to sell and make a profit, but it's still to the point, where do they go? If they were to sell, there is no place. I mean, Sarah happens to be our planning director here in Erie, and we had a discussion with our um, with our consultant for affordable homes. And so the question I asked in our meeting was, where would people go who make between $75,000 and $120,000 a year now? where would they be able to go and afford a home on the front range? And his answer was Kansas. I think <laughs> Sarah might remember that mm -hmm. and said, so you're talking about people who actually have an income. So for those who don't have an income, who are obviously retired, they may not have gotten a, a, a very good pension or retirement or what have you, there is no place for them to go. And so that's, and also interest rates and buying homes that might be more expensive for every percent we you know of increase in interest rates, it goes up by a thousand bucks. So I guess the question is, even if we try to figure out a way, we got to figure out a way to try to build housing that might be affordable, but I don't know if that's even possible given developers margins and everything that I've learned so far about that. Um, and then second, based on this demographic data, I think another thing to find out is if if we are having less children or less people moving to the state, how does this impact our ability to attract businesses to come to the Denver metro area where the major majority of the population is or in other parts of the state 
who want to come here because they're looking at having, hey, here's CU, here's University of Denver, here's all the educational institutions that we can pick all of our people from the pop to 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 hire. If that population drops off the face of the planet like it looks like it does with no children, then you're not able to attract the businesses that would get you your business revenue that would help you be able to use that revenue. Now you're relying more on just people and less businesses. So this has a dramatic just, impact. And I don't know if you can incentivize people to have lots to more jump kids. In, yeah, just mm -hmm. to jump in right here, Japan is facing this, has is facing this right now. And they have incentivized, they, they are paying people to have babies, um, uh, which is kind of interesting, but they, they are mm -hmm. ahead of us in this curve, but they are dealing with exactly what you're talking about. Um, and so that might be also a good, a, a good thing to look at because it's very challenging. Um, I know this all sounds scary, um, it means job security for me, yay. No, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, it, it, there, there are really big changes coming and, and we need, you know, our state demographer, she tells me, Jayla, if you're gonna do infrastructure changes, you have to do it in this decade. If you wait till next decade, it will be too long. And that's, yeah, and that, from, a, from a planning perspective, being, a, a project manager and looking at things, th that means that your 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 runway for trying to come up with a solution that works for what you need to do is that much shorter because then you have to implement it, which takes a longer time because of permitting, because of a lot of different laws that are out there that may take longer for zoning, et cetera, all these other things that come up. So now you've already passed that time. And then now you're in a real crunch. So it sounds like to me, at least at a local or state level, we really have to have these conversations, tangible conversations with our elect other elected officials above us or whomever to say, we got to talk about this now, the plan for not 10 years from now, but for five years from now, right, yeah. Shayla? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I okay. think we'll see that too in, in Jayla's presentation. There are a lot of really good observations in there as well. Uh, Director Odoricio. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, just checking. Um, you know, I think John Dyack asked a good question. <clears throat> I'm not sure we had addressed it. Is are we asking folks who were kind of hunkering down and not moving what it would take for them to move into some more efficient housing? I think we need to go back to that question. I look at my experience. I went through two parents that are no longer with me, and that process started with um, my mom was a teacher. She experienced cognitive decline and then eventually ended her life uh, from Alzheimer's. And that process itself, moving from her from her primary home where we grew up into a condo, then from a condo into Sarah Namella's jurisdiction over to this uh, facility where they started out as independent living, and then you get into um, assisted, and then you get to memory care. And she passed right before we were knocking on the door of skilled. But what I think is important is to understand that whole transition is that there's decisions that are made along the way to get folks to where they need to eventually go. And not everyone experiences the same cognitive decline of the path. But I look at some of the things that I saw and lived through while helping my, my mother, particularly at the end after my father died. Um, but there are some reasons why we incentivize in our system for people to stay or at least hold on to the house is number one, capital gains. Had yeah. they sold that house, while she was alive, she would have paid a significant amount of capital gains. Yeah. Um, and so the other thing is the senior exemption. Um, and mm -hmm. I think we're addressing that at the state legislature. Are we not? Or did I hear that where the senior exemption is like you have to be there for 10 years? Um, no. Yeah, that, that they are addressing it. They're, yeah. they're, they're making some changes, right? So that it's portable um, or there's proposals to, to right. make it portable. And to so that's a start. It's but that's the discounted property tax, not right. the sale. Right. Uh, yeah, There's so nothing to address the sale at There's this two, point. You're right. Two different things. One is the capital gains. They would have paid 15, 20%, whatever, on that capital gains for somebody who's lived in their house for a long time. They're like, forget it. I'll just leave it to my kids and not have any taxes because of the step up in basis. Okay. Yep. Um, you also have to look at those. This, And I hope we support that senior exemption portability. 
That's very important. But we have to look at some of the systemic things that are keeping people there. Then let's also look at the, the, the overall challenges of, are we encouraging people uh, to be able to get caregiving by family members? And it may mean that we take advantage of Medicaid and Medicare where you can have family members, I think in Medicare, take care of somebody and get compensated. Medicaid. Uh, yeah, some of the other issues that we're seeing in our community is what happens with adult children? A lot of times folks are holding onto that house because their adult children can't live or have the executive function to function on their own. So what's happening is there's bad estate planning, long-term planning that's happening where you may have a child who has special needs or maybe they just don't, they're addicted or they don't have, they can't function on their own after mom and dad are gone, they're stuck with this house because mom and dad didn't wanna leave them homeless but they end up losing the house anyway. I mean, there's some real issues that we have to address and some of the biggest challenges that a lot of the elected officials on this call have are not are sometimes from the second generation, from somebody who doesn't know how to take care of a house in a neighborhood. They, right. they don't know how to take care of themselves. They don't know how to be, you know, behave or, or, or function on their own. So we have to find ways to encourage long-term systemic planning and transition. And these are some of the things that through experience, we have to ask, like John Dyke said, ask the families who are living this day to day and not just the talking heads that we all are at times, but what is what is the reasoning behind us being in this situation? And we got to carve out and just hit one of those little challenges a long way. And I just named like three or four. But yeah, I think it's all of the above and then some, right? Yeah. People get comfortable. They don't want to move. They like their house. It's familiar. There's, they don't like change. Yeah. There's significant trauma and cognitive decline when yeah. you live in the house your whole life. And now other people, particularly your kids or so maybe a someone appointed by the law is telling you, you have to move somewhere else. Right. Absolutely. And when you do that trauma, you increase the amount of support that person's need, needs. And sometimes people can function better in the house. You move them within a week. They now need care that you never thought they needed before. Yeah. All right. I'm left. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we'll take a comment from director, director Nermella and then on to Jayla's presentation. Thanks for letting me talk one more time. Um, so, well, one, I was thinking about that senior exemption, I guess, you, you know, unless it's portable to Kansas, um, we, we certainly um, have a mismatch in our housing stock. And when I think about the, um, like in, in Denver, I think we're closer in some of our, in some of the more urban areas to um, a 50-50 to even a 60-40 renter to ownership uh, ratio of the housing stock itself, but in a lot of our suburban areas, it's the opposite. It's more like 66% uh, owner to 30% um, renter, but those are mostly single family. And so um, I think it would be helpful to really take a look at our overall housing stock. Again, I, I think that certainly speaks to needing to do a regional um, housing analysis um, and couple that with an understanding of what are the projected incomes for the that um, for those 65 and older um, adults because you know what are they actually going to be able to afford? Are we going to see a decline in income over the years? Um, and the last thing that I um, am thinking about is if we have a lot of rental stock because we haven't been producing condos. Is there some policy incentive, um, incentivization that we could do to um, convert existing rental communities over to ownership? Kind of make up for lost time and a lot of lost time. Um, because I know a lot of people would love to move their senior exemption somewhere, but they will have to go rent. So um, to get something smaller and more feasible for them. So anyway, those are just some additional thoughts, but thank you for letting me go again. Thank you. No, very uh, house, valuable comments. I was just going to add that the house, the own versus rental piece is, is really important because the um, older adults who rent are much, much more likely to be housing burdened um, in this region than owners um, because of not being protected from um, rent increases. So that, that's a really important piece of it. Good point. So Jayla is all queued up and ready to go um, to present uh, survey results and areas of focus for the 2023 to 2027 
plan on area plan on aging. So please go ahead, Jayla Sanchez Warren, the director of Area Agency on Aging. Great, thank you so much. I think we can continue our conversations here. Um, I'd like to give you some background first. So every four years in the state of Colorado, we have to do an area plan on aging. Um, and the area plans are used by the, color, by the state of Colorado to develop a state plan on aging. Um, and then it goes to the administration on aging, which is the federal level, the administration for community living slash administration on aging. Um, and they use it to identify trends, uh, needs, develop service priorities, um, discuss spending allocation and look at demonstration projects. The administration on aging, this is important to understand, develops the plan format. Um, and so they, they come up with the format and the questions, then they give it to the state, the state adds questions. Um, and the plan is due uh, to the state on March 30th. We wanted to give you an opportunity to look at this version. There, this is the compliance version of the area plan on aging. We will be working on a more consumer friendly public access kind of plan that will start, that will implement in July uh, that talks about other things like housing. You can't talk about the aging of a region without talking about housing. And so we are going to work on that. We will share that with you and get your comment on that uh, before we um, uh, give that out to the public. Um, but we also wanted you to see the compliance piece uh, that's gonna go to the state. So the areas of focus on the, in this compliance piece um, I, they talk about public input. Public input is really important in this plan. Demographics, they wanna know about the survey that we did. So every AAA in the state did a community assessment survey of older adults, which I'll talk about. They wanna know about volunteers because many of our services um, utilize volunteers. And then the COVID pandemic response. Um, they, wanted us to, they want us to talk about core services special emphasis on social isolation, because we learned a lot about social isolation during the pandemic, the ombudsman program, the legal assistance program, diversity, equity, inclusion. How are you going to add that? How, what are you doing differently? Target and outreach, innovation and expansion, and then other services. It's important to know sometimes they just want you to report, and then sometimes they want you to know what you're going to do about it. So you will see that throughout the report. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the community assessment survey that we did of older adults. This is a survey where we ask older adults what they think about 17 aspects of livabilities in their communities. What you um, need to know is we have a regional report and then we have uh, county reports. We also did reports for the city of Commerce City for Golden and for Aurora because their senior commissions on aging are very active and, and ask us specifically if we could, could do um, to just focus on their communities. It looks at this, the COSOA, we call it COSOA, um, looks at community design, employment and finance, equity and inclusive, inclusivity, health and wellness, information assistance and productive activities. So what we learned from this survey, oh, I should tell you, we've done this survey four year, or four times, so 16 years of, of survey results. Um, this time surveys were sent out um, to 39,000 people, only 4,595 returned um, the, the survey, which was our lowest response rate ever um, at 12.5. 5% response rate with a margin of error of uh, 1.45. We also did community conversations with 250 participants, focusing on some of those populations that we knew were unlikely to fill out our survey. Met with folks in the Eastern Plains, in the mountains, Spanish speaking 
um, elders as well as in refugee communities, people who live in low income, low income residences, and those who are homeless and veterans. We also did con uh, a key informant session with 61 community service providers, those people who serve older adults every single day and, and got their ideas of what, what were, they think the challenges and the opportunities are going forward. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about demographics. So this is a chart that shows the adult population, um, older adult population by census tract. And you can see where we are right now. The darker the color, the more density, the more people over 60 um, uh, in, the, in the region. So you can see Gilpin and Clear Creek, they're our oldest counties. Uh, Jefferson County, big, Douglas County, growing rapidly in this area. And then parts of Denver and um, Arapaho. I don't know what this little community is here, but I need to target that. I know that. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, then we look at, so the, the Older Americans Act, which is our federal law that guides us, says we have to target our services to those that are 75 and older, to those who are um, uh, below uh, or below poverty, to those who are minority and those who are geographically isolated or socially isolated, meaning homebound. And so this shows where the people 65 and older below the poverty line live currently. This helps us target our services a little bit better um, and in really trying to figure out who are those most in need. Again, the darker colors representing a bigger population. The next is the non-white population by census track. And you can see a lot of that is in the Denver area. Um, some in Broomfield, Brighton area, but it's, it's concentrated you know, Denver and some in, in um, you know, the Aurora area for sure. This is more about what Zach was already showing us. This shows the, the population forecast again. Uh, right now or in 2020, we had, uh, you know, about half a million people uh, that were older adults. And when you look at the 30 years from now, you see the 60 and older is a, a, a significantly more of share of the population. You see that our population is growing, but that the, that the zero to 17 is flat pretty much. And so is the 18 to 59. This is where the growth is. And it's so important because we have to start, like you've been talking about thinking about this and what that means for our communities. Um, with the aging of a population, you can also expect to see more people with disabilities, right? More people who have blown out knees from skiing or um, who have cognitive issues physically and, and, um, and, and cognitive decline where they need help. So you can see that we're gonna have a bigger population. Not only are they gonna be older, but they're going to have um, a, a disability. And so we've got to get our infrastructure in place. I think about this all the time when I think about transportation. Um, just during COVID, our transportation providers who we fund said, you know, we're, we, we're seeing more wheelchairs and more walkers than we saw pre-COVID just in two years. Um, we're seeing more people with dementia and so we have to think about what that means when we design our communities, when we, you know, when we design, when you work with developers, are our sidewalks appropriate? All of those infrastructure things, um, I think are so important to think about now, not, not 10 years from now. Now we have to start thinking about these to prepare for this population because we want people to be able to live independently as long as they can. We talk about, you know, well, maybe it's time for mom to go to a nursing home. Guess what? Mom gets to decide unless she's legally deemed incapacitated by a court of law. 
And trust me, I've gone through this with my mother-in-law. You're not taking me. And I knew that I couldn't force her to go there. And my husband was saying, Jayla, we got to move her. And I'm like, she, she, it's against the law. We can't. It's involuntary confinement. So what are some ways? We also know that more people are going to struggle to live independently, whether it's managing their yards, right? Think about all those beautification codes that you have in your communities, keeping the yard mode and the weeds down and the house painted. Um, are people going to be able to do that as well? Uh, so how, you know, are we going to have enough care staff to help them in their homes where they want to stay? Or are we going to see more people decline slowly and slowly and then have those tra tragedies that we've all seen in our communities as well? The Community Assessment Survey of Older Adults this is the COSOA that I was talking to you about. Um, it identifies community strengths to support successful aging, identifies needs, estimates the contribution made by older adults in their community, um, and then talks about estimated projections of residents' need in the future. It's a random sample of older um, adult households. It was a multi-contact mail uh, method mailed and online survey. And the, the data was statistically weighted to reflect the older population. So it's statistically significant um, survey. The goal is to use it to make really immediate decisions like planning and resource allocation. How am I gonna spend the money we have? Am I gonna add a service? Am I not gonna add a service? Um, uh, if there's budget cuts, what, what should I cut? What should I not cut? Um, intermediate. We're really looking at, okay, so we, we need, we've got these gaps. How do we fill these gaps? It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen over five years. How do we move towards those? And then um, to support a community of older adults that's more healthy, more engaged, more empowered, more independent, productive, and vibrant. And isn't that what we want for ourselves? Not only for our older adults, but guys, we're talking about us in 30 years. Um, and what do we want for us? So what we see here is a score of community readiness. And community readiness is the things that communities do to help people live as independently as possible or to help them um, be able to maintain in their, in their communities and homes, which they want to be in, right? Um, in this, it's not scored the way you would in like in school. So a zero is poor, 33 is considered um, fair, 67 is good, and then 100 is excellent. So when we asked older adults in our community, they said, you know, I'm pretty okay. I'm pretty satisfied. Um, I think my community is a good place to live and retire. And, I, and I'm gonna recommend it as a place to retire. And then we start digging down a little bit deeper and we ask them about community design, things like housing and mobility and land use and the scores get lower. They're even more lower when we're talking about finances and employment opportunities for engagement is um, our lower score here. And then equity inclusivity. This is a lot about, not only about um, accepting people uh, for, you know, who are diverse in culture or religion, it's also ageism. Um, and, and people are like, well, I, you know, we could do better here. I'll give you more detail as we go along. Health and wellness, uh, which includes all of these uh, areas of health and wellness, we, you know, we got work to do there um, in our communities. Uh, to support people, information and assistance. I'm telling you, this is the bane of my existence. This has been this way my entire career, no matter how much money we put in. I think it's because people don't want to talk about aging. Nope, not me. I'm not doing it. It's not going to happen to me until they need to, right? And then when they need to, they're generally in crisis and they go, holy holy moly, what do I do? Who do I call? How do I get help? What's the help out there? Who, you know, do I have the money for the help? Does she have the money for the help? All the, those kinds of things. 
Um, and we have to somehow get better at that. So anyone who has ideas, I would love to hear that. Productive um, activities, civic engagement, social uh, engagement, and then supporting caregivers. So those are kind of our readiness. Uh, we'll dive down into this a little bit more. Here's the good news. 86, 87% of folks said, hey, you know what? I feel like my quality of life is either good or excellent. That's wonderful. Only 2% said that they thought their, their quality of life was bad. Um, so that's good news. This is also really good news. 70% or higher said that they thought the ease of travel by car was good, that they could get to places they wanted to visit. They um, had opportunities to, to go to spiritual events and activities and um, ease of walking has improved in their community. This is wonderful news um, because we have invested a lot of money in the AAA in transportation, but also there's been a lot of talk and you know, improving uh, these aspects of, of, of mobility. Um, opportunities again, 60 to, to 69 percent um, opportunities to volunteer. This is an increase. This wasn't the case four years ago. Also, availability of preventative health services such as health screening, flu shots, and educational workshops is up, which is really good because it wasn't this case, wasn't the case four years ago. Now, areas where there are challenges, more than 75%, this shouldn't be surprising to you all after our conversation, said they had um, the following challenges, problems with availability of accessible housing, such as homes with no step entries, single floor living, wide hallways and doorways. Um, the cost of living in communities is really hard to keep pace and the affordability of quality housing, right? Now there's some hotels out there that you can rent that are kind of cheap, but who would want to live there? Um, and, and this is becoming a bigger and bigger problem in the metropolitan area. Also, some people from the um, other parts of the state are moving into the metropolitan area to get more service, but they, they can't afford the housing. So this is a big, huge challenge. These were among our lowest scores. Um, more than 50 percent of the region's population is not knowing where services, how to get services, or doing heavy housework, um, maintaining the home. These are big problems that we hear a lot about. We heard about it in our community conversations. We talked, we had people say, you know, I talked to someone who was just recently widowed, and she said, it, it was actually five weeks that she had been widowed. She said, how am I going to take care of this house? I don't know how to do this. I can't get the neighbor boys to mow my lawn. They don't do that, I guess, anymore. Who do who who can I call? And that's a really big issue for folks. Um, adequate information about all the benefit programs, right? There are 32 Medicare programs in the state of Colorado. How do you navigate those? They change every single year. That's really confusing to people. Um, and people are worried about fraud uh, and you know, being scammed on, on those kind of benefit programs. 40 to 50% of the older adults said they had challenges with their physical health yard work, staying physically fit, feeling like your voice is heard in the community. People don't listen to me, I'm old. I hear this all the time. When I turned gray, I disappeared for people. Um, this is something that is, uh, I, I, we have to make an effort to engage these folks because they're going to make up a huge portion of our community. And then having enough money to meet our daily expenses or their daily expenses. It's getting harder and harder. Uh, Director Shaw has heard me tell this story, but you know, I, I work with people who, who retired um, and they said, you know, my retirement was fine. 20 years ago when I retired and now I'm 85 and it's not meaning I, I can't, I can't make it now. My doc says I could probably live 10 more years. I can't afford to live 10 more years. 
Um, and that's, that's a scary position to be in. Um, the needs of older adults in the region, these were the top uh, needs, housing, shouldn't be a surprise, information about services, healthcare, and then physical health. All of these, you can, um, uh, Melinda, if you can drop that information into the chat, you can get your COSOA report for your county and take a look at it. Now, Tom, um, you're in Boulder County and Boulder County also has did a COSOA. So you would be able to get that information. Anyone in Boulder County um, can get it from their area agency on aging. Great. I told you one of the areas that the, the feds wanted to know about was the impact of, of COVID uh, and social isolation. So one of the things that, that the negative impacts of the pandemic is we had to scale back services. Um, most of our services are in person, right? Um, and moving transportation, going to get somebody, helping them into the van. Um, we didn't stop all services, but they were definitely slowed down. Uh, you may remember that our primary transportation provider stopped providing transportation services in the middle of the pandemic and we had to stand up a brand new program as did in-home service providers. So these are people that help people bathe, dress, meal preparation. Um, and they, two of our providers went out of business during the pandemic. Um, Many of our service providers had to lay off staff because they just couldn't do their work. Um, they couldn't get paid. We pay them to go out and, and transport, take people to the grocery store and nobody was going to the grocery store. So they had to lay off staff. We had a lot of staff leave in the AAA. So did our community service providers. Um, almost half of our staff left in the area agency on aging. Um, we lost a lot of volunteers. Volunteers of America, our Meals on Wheels program had over 800 volunteers and they lost more than half of those volunteers. Remember, those are people that take Meals on Wheels to the doorsteps of, of individuals that helps them stay independent and living in um, their own homes. We had clients die, which was very hard. We had staff get sick. Uh, two of my staff were hospitalized and one continues to deal with very significant long COVID issues. And that's not just, you know, that's just what happened in the AAA. Uh, a lot of organizations are facing these same issues. Reduce contact with clients. That's hard for social workers. We're used to saying, if there's a problem, let's go out and see it, right? And it took a, it took a toll on, on all of us who, you could only talk to them in, on the phone and hear their pain and anxiety and you want to go out and help and you can't do it. Um, and then we had to provide a lot of personal protective and uh, cleaning supplies, um, which was challenging. There were some positive things that happened as a result of providing or, or uh, as a result of, of the pandemic. We received more money than we've ever had ever in the history of the Area Agency on Aging. The, the federal regulations and the state regulations were really relaxed and, and allowed us to do, allowed us so much flexibility in our funding. And we were able to respond to needs very quickly and pivot when we needed to. Um, we adapted and changed services to uh, meet evolving needs. So in the beginning, it was all about delivery food and toilet paper and incontinent supplies. And then we were paying our contractors to go out and deliver food to individuals, right? We could change. And then we, then it was this big push to get everybody vaccinated. So we worked with hospitals and we provided transportation to, for people to get to get vaccines and that was really important that flexibility allowed us to change. It was encouraged, innovation was encouraged. How are you going to meet this need that you had just identified? Who can do it? Who has the resources? Who has, how, how do we move money to that person or, or to that agency so they can serve? Um, we developed new services, new partnerships, and we, re and we strengthened relationships with county health and human services, worked a lot with county health, more than I've ever worked with county departments of health, um, worked a lot, especially during the beginning of the pandemic. The lasting challenges that we're still seeing, 
service reductions. There are things like the congregate meal programs where people came to community centers and ate a meal together. Those have not come back. People are still very, very nervous about being in groups. Um, and so we've done grab and go meals as opposed to coming in and sitting down. Um, there's the, the levels of staff and volunteers have not yet recovered from pre-pandemic pre levels. That means not as much service can happen. Um, increased costs of labor, food, gas, supply chains. Oh my gosh, the cost of a Meals on Wheels pre-pandemic was $8. Now it's at $13 just because everything has gone up. Um, loss of contracted service providers. I told you about that. But the challenge of partnering with new ones, they're like, we'd love to take your money, but we don't have the staff to do what you're asking us to do. And so that's a really big challenge. And then we continue to deal with outbreaks of COVID. We have about 60 nursing homes and assisted living facilities that have active outbreaks. We have um, you know, and um, we have challenges where we'll start a meal site and then we have COVID, so they have to close down and they work in every county department of health has different protocols. That's been really challenging. Um, it continues. I just had COVID last week. It's still out there, guys, I'm telling you. And it's, um, you know, about 330 people die every single day of COVID in the, in the United States. And people say, well, that's not too bad, but it's a plane crash. If we had a plane crash where all or most of the people died every day, people would be freaking out. Um, effects of isolation. Remember in the early days of the pandemic, it was all about older adults, right? Older adults are the most vulnerable, 65 and older. Um, shelter in place. Um, they had designated shopping times. Remember, go at your designated shopping times. Over and older, old, over and over, older adults were showed on the news. There's this many deaths from COVID. The majority of them are in the 65 plus population. That was two and a half years of hearing that over and over and over. Um, and, 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 that had impact on folks. Um, nursing homes and assisted living facilities banned all visitors. Visitors were not allowed to go in. Residents were confined to their room. They didn't get to even, you know, they didn't get to dine together. There was no chatting in the halls. There was no families coming in or anyone from the outside, including ombudsman for a while. And we had to work really hard to get ourselves in there to advocate on behalf of older adults. Some residents were moved out of their rooms to facilitate the creation of COVID units uh, and facilities. And many, many of our older adults lost friends or loved ones to COVID. This has taken its toll we're seeing increased anxiety and depression, depression um, attributed to the lack of social interaction during the pandemic. We're seeing increased diagnosed cases of agoraphobia, which is the fear of leaving home or entering crowded spaces, decrease in physical abilities and increased levels of confusion, which I talked about earlier. Um, older adults reported uh, feeling sad, sadness and mourning and frustration. I talked to one lady in our community conversation. She said, I'm angry. I'm angry that two of my years of my life have been stolen from me. I didn't get to see my grandchildren for two years. They were not teenagers and now they are. They're like totally different people to me. Um, and she was really frustrated. And we heard that over and over about these. I don't have many more years left. And I I am angry that that happened to me. Uh, plans to address social isolation. So the state and the feds ask us, what are we gonna do? And um, so we're gonna do some things that we realized worked during the pandemic. Um, solutions like voice assisted technology. We uh, funded and, uh, and many of our providers distributed Echo Dots out to the community. And I don't know if you have an Alexa or an Echo Dot, but you can say Echo, you know, or Alexa, tell me a joke, sing me a song, um, tell me a limerick. Oh, oh no, that's sorry. I have an Alexa. 
<laughs> sorry, um, <laughs> develop um, more virtual education. So we still have people that don't want to come out. If they don't want to come out, then can we engage them virtually um, to do activities and education and counseling? Um, one of our senior support, no, senior resource center did virtual drum circles, which were absolutely fantastic. And it engaged folks during that time. Um, we're, we're looking at ways, okay, if you don't want to go to a senior center, will you go to a restaurant that would partner with us? And that gets you out of your home and you're going to get good nutritious food and you have some increased social activity. So we are looking at a lot of different ways. Um, we really want to revitalize the congregate meal program. Um, one of the things that we lost during the pandemic was transportation to meal sites. Uh, we used to pay Seniors Resource Center to take people and pick them up and take them to the meal sites. VIA couldn't do that for us and hasn't been able to do that for us yet. It's very expensive right now. It would cost about $150 round trip to take someone to a meal that cost uh, you know, $13. And does that make economic sense? I don't know. Um, we have to think about those hard questions. Offering entertainment at meals. So we do know that if you offer entertainment, music, there's an Elvis impersonator out there that's very, very popular at meal sites. Um, they will go and they will stay longer and they will have a good time. Also providing things like education, health clinics, foot clinics, blood pressure checks, sugar checks um, can also bring people in. And so we're gonna explore those as well. Uh, how do you reach all populations, right? So we are going to tailor outreach and messaging to targeted populations in underserved areas, translate materials and provide translation services um, to increase access and engagement increase our virtual services, both in English and in other languages. Um, uh, one of the things that we found out is that our hoarders uh, support group, people who hoard, um, we have support groups and they had an increase in people attending those support groups virtually. Now it should make sense if you know anything about the psychology of hoarding, it makes a lot of sense that that would happen, but we never even thought about that. And so we're going to look at exploring those and offering more services virtually. And then one of the things that's really important to us is to on cultural competency. Um, we have uh, uh, Boulder County and, and, and Dr. Cog have worked together on a program uh, that, that helps uh, service providers serve people, elders who are LGBTQ um, better. And we will be implementing that uh, as well as implicit bias training to all of our contracted service providers. All right, we're getting there guys. Um, increased transportation to remove barriers. This is a problem in the, in the, in the rural areas. Transportation is really hard in the rural areas. We do have one contracted provider that um, is going into the mountain communities. We need to expand service in the Eastern Plains. And so that's a priority for us. We will be offering medical diets, more medical diets, um, diets. So one of the things that we're seeing is malnutrition is up significantly. And so we have asked Project Angel Heart, who is one of our contracted providers to um, do meals specifically tailored towards those who are considered malnourished, and then also offer uh, meals uh, that are more culturally appropriate. Uh, we have an aging mastery program. It's an evidence-based program that, that helps people learn how to age well, basically. Um, we've translated that into four different languages. We'll be doing two more languages. Um, uh, you know, really, that there's a huge emphasis on making participant uh, directed client centered uh, planning for older adults. We've expanded this and will continue to expand um, how to do this with the um, caregivers and, and case management options counseling and in home assistance, really working with caregivers to empower and, and know how to not take the power away from the people that they're helping. Um, 
and then work with uh, our aging advisory committee is not very diverse right now and we need to make it more diverse and we are already starting conversations and working on that in the ombudsman program st staffing is a huge crisis the biggest crisis it's the worst i've ever seen it i've worked at dr cog or in the field of aging for 36 years now it's the worst i have ever seen it we have got to advocate for improved staffing in nursing homes in particular also assisted living but nursing homes one of the things that we're seeing is the health department will go out and cite things. Let's say someone doesn't get a bath or someone's call light isn't answered. Um, they will cite the facility for not following the regulation uh, regarding call light response, or they might cite them for not having enough staff, but they don't cite, which they can and should for the violation of residence rights which is, you know, if someone has to sit in their urine and feces for hours at a time, that should be cited. If someone wanted to take a shower and they didn't get to take one for two weeks, that should be cited also as a residence rights violation. Um, uh, oversight of guardians. There's been a big increase in the complaints about public guardianship, um, uh, mainly a court appointed guardians who aren't family members but family members as well um we want to advocate that that guardians who uh, uh abuse their privilege in that area um that there be consequences and oversight to that process um and then abuse abuse has gone up in nursing homes and neglect uh the cases and we want to just create more education about what that looks like and the pace program remember that's the 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 program for all inclusive care of the elderly this is a program this is innovage remember innovage they were they were um uh, fined and actually suspended service uh because of violations and so there that that created a, a lot of concern and um statewide and so there are efforts to get we are the only program in the state of Colorado that has advocates for people who are on the PACE program. Um, there was plans to uh, make sure that everyone in the state had that. And so these are goals in that area. Evidence-based services, we already provide several evidence-based services. The, the, the uh, Administration for Community Living is really big on this. They want you to use evidence-based services. We plan to put in place a caregiver support program. Um, three of our contracted providers who used to provide caregiver support have decided not to do that anymore. So we're gonna take it in-house and follow some really good models of area, other area agencies on aging in the state as well as uh, uh, in the country. And we will engage um, two evidence-based programs uh, that are designed for caregivers uh, in that process. We have been working so hard, right? We know the growth in our older population is gonna grow rapidly we saw doubling of the population, right? I can guarantee you our funding is not gonna double either by from the state or from the feds. So what can we do uh, to keep pace with the needs to support older adults in our communities? And we have to really work on that. We're also facing a big fiscal cliff. So all of that COVID money, as you all know, um, is going to go away in October 2024. But guess what? The need doesn't go away. That means for our AAA alone, we lose a little more than $6 million. How are we going to make up that difference? I don't think the state's going to give it to us. I don't think the feds are going to give it to us. So we've got to We've got to work on col collaborative advocacy, working with our community providers, because remember, it's not just the area agency on aging, it's the 50 community organizations that we fund as well. Um, we, we need to include, um, to advocate at the state level, but more importantly, to include payment for community-based services into Medicare. There's lots of talk about that going on right now. We want that to happen 
so that we can then bill Medicare for some of those services. It's a new payment source that I think has the best potential for us to keep pace. Now that's a problem at the national level because Medicare is gonna be a trillion dollar program, right? So how do we deal with all of those issues? Um, we have a new data system. Uh, we have survey information and get in-house gap analysis. We need to really take all of that information and figure out how to provide the best service that we can that's gonna serve the most people and those most in need. Um, provide more, mutual um, <laughs> virtual services, and then streamline assessments. There, are, oh man, when you are a, a, a community contractor of ours, there are so many regulations that you have to go through. And we are really working with the state and the federal government to reduce administrative burdens on those contracted service providers so that they can serve people and not have to worry as much about the um, data. The data is important, but we don't want it to, uh, to reduce service. Um, and then uh, the, the things that we're trying to do is really be as, as innovative as we can, working with partners in the healthcare arena and the we have been um, invited to be a part of the Administration for Community Living Community Care Hub, which is a big deal. Um, uh, they're looking at how to integrate payments um, in Medicare for social determinants of health. Um, that's the, the, the words now that people use. Um, we wanna work with healthcare providers and demonstrate that if you invest in overall well-being of older adults, it re reduces healthcare costs. We have a contract coming up with Denver Health. We're working on one with Intermountain Health, and um, we're in conversations with um, insurance companies as well, uh, United Insurance Company. So hopefully some of those will pan out. And that's my presentation. Wow, I know, like drinking from a fire hose. But um, I, I, I wanted you to know what we're doing, what we're thinking, and um, you will get the opportunity to put input into the more public version of, of the area plan on aging. We use that public version to really help people understand what's happening in our region and ask them to, to help in, in, in basically, you know, the area agency on aging can't do this by ourselves. As you just talked about, we need infrastructure development. We need housing. We need all of these things. But people have to understand the issue first. And that's the goal of the um, more uh, public-facing document. Thank you, Jayla. Oh, and, you know, with like two and a half minutes to Fair. Hey, I'm I made it through. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent job. And truly, it was great to have that robust discussion after Zach's presentation, which was wonderful as well. So uh, unless there are any immediate questions for Jayla, um, I think um, we'll uh, announce that our next board work session is April 5th, and um, unless there are other matters by members, speak now, or it's 528 and our meeting is adjourned. Thanks I got so through, much, everyone. <laughs> Good job, Jayla. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good. 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 Thank you. Good. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.